folks, this is Dr. Emily Sterling with AR, and I'd like to say hello to all of our friends in Oklahoma. There is so much expertise from Oklahoma represented in the federal resources. There's a lot going on. The state has a well-recognized climate office. The USDA, the Department of the Interior, and NOAA have regional hubs in Oklahoma. And that's not even to mention all of the other incredible work going on at the University of Oklahoma. So some of our coastal friends might wonder, why is there so much going on in Oklahoma? First off, today, Oklahoma is a major energy hub and a major agricultural producer. As we look towards the 2050 forecast for the nation as a whole, we see Oklahoma emerge as this absolutely critical point for building national resilience. I'm not gonna sugarcoat it, the state is facing big challenges, but in this state, we see incredible resilience emerging, just a full-throated response to these challenges. For Oklahoma, every threat I found, the state already has eyes peeled. Let's talk about the weather. The weather in Oklahoma has never been what you might call pleasant. I mean, this is the plains, it's an extreme environment. We've always had drought and hail and deluge into the state, and it's only getting worse. In the last 10 years, Oklahoma has seen just crazy storms, huge rains that have washed out highways, big impacts on the infrastructure. And Oklahoma has also seen very severe drought in recent years, particularly in the panhandle. You might be familiar that this state has pretty dramatic variation in precipitation from east to west across the state. You can see the current climb here. This is in the map from the NCA, the federal report that I use. This difference is projected to become more extreme, but there's not gonna be a total decrease in precipitation projected for the region. So let's take a look at what's going on right now. Right now in Oklahoma, you can see maybe 10 to 20 inches of rain here in the panhandle. Over in this uh, southeast corner, 50 to 60, pretty dramatic. When that gets more extreme, the panhandle here is gonna be pretty darn dry. And in this corner of the state in particular, you're gonna need to prepare for deluges of rain on the regular. Big challenge, right? But there not being a total drop in precipitation makes this be a very different story than some of the drought stories that we've had to look at in the Southwest. Water issues, they're critical for this state. The Western part of the state in particular right now is using the Oglala a lot for water, and that's not gonna be sustainable for agriculture long-term. The Oklahoma water plan, the state has a water plan because they're looking at these issues, indicates that water use projections in Oklahoma are expected to increase over the next 50 years by 20% for municipal use, 20% for ag use, and 60% for energy use. So when we think about moving towards 2050, water conservation and water management have emerged as crucial for the state's resilience. Managing those heavy rains and finding ways to use that water in the east managing and conserving water in the West, they're both essential pieces of the puzzle. But the state, because of the, the fact that the precipitation isn't decreasing in total, the state's gonna have what it needs. It's not a really grim picture. It's not a bad drought picture like we see further west of here. It's a water story with potential. The extreme storms in this area, the extreme storms that come with the water, it is accurate and unheeded to call them life-threatening, both historically and today. As we move towards 2050, preparing for the storms to increase in intensity, it's another resilience priority. Fortunately for people in Oklahoma, they're already building incredible weather resilience in the state. They're tracking these extreme storms really closely. You know, when a tornado is coming at you, you need to know about it so that you can be safe. They're tracking them very closely with this state-funded agricultural weather network the Oklahoma Mesonet. I want to show it to you because it's very cool and I'm very jealous of it and wish that I had access to it for my state. So this has changed a lot since I looked at it last 10 minutes ago as I was getting ready to make this video. This thing is updated constantly. It shows air temperature by county. It shows precipitation down to the hundredth of an inch. It gives you information on weather today and tomorrow. It gives you information on fire management. We're gonna come back to that. A lot of public safety coordinated here in an extremely user-friendly page. Like, nice job, very nice. And when you can get information on when storms are gonna hit, that's so important for preparedness when you're talking about life-threatening weather. And thanks to the Mesonet, Oklahoma is completely on top of it. 
It would be one thing if we were talking about a population that had no exposure to face extreme storms, but on the plains, people know we have to build and live with extreme weather in mind. The weather trends that Oklahoma is facing are a serious matter, but they're less concerning because we're dealing with a difference in degree rather than a difference in kind. We're in a better position, right? It's a little easier when we already have a basic familiarity with the threat and some cultural understanding of how to deal with the threat. On top of uh, modern tools, it's gonna be okay. I wanna look at the summer heat projections now. Uh, they are not so different in tone from the weather projections. We know that Oklahoma has a hot summer, it's projected to get hotter, but we are talking about more moderate projected increases than I've seen in many other states. I wanna show you a map from the feds looking at increases in extreme heat. Let me pull that up. All right, just a second. I'm zooming in before we switch over so I don't blare with you too bad. Just one second. Okay, here we go. All right, so this lets us look at what's gonna happen in Oklahoma by the end of the 21st century. So we're not talking about 2050 here, we're talking about the end of the century, looking at two scenarios, if we don't reduce emissions and if we do, which I think is the more likely outcome. In this lower scenario, by the end of the century, so beyond 2050, we are talking about a warm up, particularly in this area along the border, but it's not that bad. We're talking about days over 100 on this map, and we're looking at maybe a month over 100 degrees. I feel like that is within our cultural expectations for resilience in this environment. I think that's fairly comforting. I wanna look at um, days over 86 as well. Let's go look at the USDA heat map. Pull that up a little bit quicker. So if we look at the USDA heat map, right now we can see that based on historic data from, oh no. This is weird, just a second. All right, now we're back into the historic data. This is from 1980 to 2009. You can see that Oklahoma is one of our peach colored states on the heat map, about 120 to 150 degree days, over 86 degrees a year. And if we look over here, we look at that moderate emissions scenario for 2050, it does change but it doesn't change that dramatically. A lot of the parts of the state that had been that light peach, 120, have gone to a max of 150, so manageable change. About a month longer summer we're talking about in Oklahoma, and one month in the middle of the summer is probably gonna be more intense. It's gonna be more like 100 degree heat instead of 90 degree heat. So an increased need for cooling but again, it won't feel so different to us then, it won't feel so different to the next generation as it might in other parts of the country. Other parts of the country are looking at a more extreme summer heat up. But with the increased heat, you are talking about serious potential for increased aridity, for a shift towards desert in the landscape. Particularly in the panhandle in Oklahoma, we're looking at a potential for desertification and soil loss, and you know, it's not as if those are unfamiliar threats for the region. You might remember in the Dust Bowl, Oklahoma was very affected in the 30s. Working to conserve soil is going to be very important in this state. And I'm happy to say that the state extension office is really pretty aggressive about these issues. I'm just gonna show you really quick that the Oklahoma State University has a lot of resources on soil here in the state ag office very practical resources. And this is one of the few extension offices where they're doing outreach to convince people to put cover crops on construction sites. Thinking about that level of soil conservation, I think it's a really smart practice. I haven't seen it promoted in this context before. I think it's very nice. There's also a lot of uh, potential for wildfire as we look at that increased aridity. You might have noticed I pointed out that they had the fire resources on the Mesonet tool. The extension office also talks about fire management a lot. Oklahoma has seen some big wildfires in the last 10 years. And you know, there are ways we can build resilience to wildfire. We can see some ways the extension office has been working to help promote fire for land management and the healthy use of fire. 
And that's going to be a critical tool for reducing wildfire and managing the changing landscape. There's also a lot of fire resilience work you can do at home with landscaping choices in suburban areas and around people's properties. Making fire safe areas around homes that can make a big difference when it comes to protecting your lives and property. As we build resilience in the state, spreading the word about the increase in wildfire and the need to plan for it, that's probably one of the biggest challenges people are facing here that they might not already know about. It's worth bringing up in conversation. Let's take a minute, let's look at projected changes in the winter. We're gonna do that by looking at changes in the plant hardiness zone, which of course, you know, I'm from a fellow agricultural state. We all wanna know if we're looking at changes in the zones. Let's see what it says. All right, so here we've got our historical information from the 80s to 2009 in Oklahoma. We can see that the zone is pretty firmly straddling zones six and seven. And let's see what's going to happen under that reduced emission scenario for 2050. So we see a lot of change around the state, but there's not a lot of change in the state here. Look at that again. The majority of the state stays safely in zone six. And most of the cities of the state are in that area that's not going to be experiencing a zone shift. So by the border here, by the Texas border, you do see some movement, some zone eight coming in. You have some of your zone six uh, leaving, but the majority of the state stays a zone seven and most of the populated areas, you're not gonna have a problem with your trees that are well-established because of the lack of a zone shift. It's really nice news. It's a sweet spot here for Oklahoma, both north and south of the state. I've seen bigger shifts in agricultural zones. So there's nice relative stability here. Wrapping this all up, I have to say, this is one of the forecasts where I learned the most. I didn't know that Oklahoma was going to be so strong coming in. And the regional forecast for the Southern Great Plains is so challenging. I, I kind of expected a rougher ride for Oklahoma than I found. For sure, this state is not a place for the faint hearted, but it never has been. And like I said earlier, life threatening weather is the baseline for this area. Considering that, the outlook just isn't that bad, particularly for that central most populated part of the state. There's not a lot of change there, relatively speaking, by 2050. If you've been watching this channel for a while, you've probably seen that most of our other energy hubs are projected to be pretty foobar by mid-century, particularly in the Gulf. Oklahoma's energy infrastructure is so important to our national well-being and security day, but in the face of the projected changes, we should all be extremely relieved to see this great resilience potential in the Oklahoma forecast. The world's largest oil storage tank facility is in Cushing, Oklahoma, with 13% of US total storage, and there's a lot of pipeline convergence in Oklahoma. There are more earthquakes in the area lately. I don't wanna not mention that trend, but neither is that really a phenomena that falls under the climate outlook. We need to reduce emissions, but we will still be using fossil fuels for energy under the moderate emission scenario. And no matter what technological advances arise, the expertise of the energy professionals in this state will continue to be crucial for our nation. Also, and this is just me spitballing here. We have seen the huge need in the Southwest for water and how that is going to increase. Up by the Great Lakes, we're gonna have even more water than we have now. Are we kinda of gonna have too much water? It seems to me not implausible that we could use some people who know how to manage a giant national networks of pipes that channel critical fluid resources. What do I know? I don't know. Thanks, Oklahoma, though. You all are giving me hope. This is Dr. Schoening with AR signing out. Please like and subscribe. Help get the message out there. There is hope. We can prepare for what's coming. Let's get ready.